And I am grateful for uh, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Marvin shared, and uh, just uh, I heard the ones that got saved during that weekend. That's awesome. And uh, uh, Andrew shared last week. I heard the ones that got saved on that weekend. Just awesome that things are going on. Grateful to all the staff and everybody able to let us go and get away from things. I only had three calls that happened that were connected with the church, and none of those came from staff, so that's awesome. They did a great job. They took care of things, and, and it was great to get away. While I was gone and, and I was thinking about the messages as I was coming back, I said something three weeks ago in the message that we touched on, and I really thought before we step into John chapter 4, we ought to just camp here a little bit, because when you camp at this idea, you know, I've said it in many other times, but I have to let it go because it, it's just too big. Matter of fact, half the scriptures I had, I had to get rid of just so I could say what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, uh, but but uh, there's such a wonderful thing here, and this is the scripture that I mentioned three weeks ago. I just want to put it up here on the screen. And uh, it's, yeah, 1 Corinthians. I could walk over and I could read it there too. <laughs> is it coming up? There we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And, and I, I wanted to say that. It's talking about the very first Adam, the start of the human race, and then it's talking about Jesus. But I want you to understand, it's not saying Jesus was the last of, of that race. He is saying that Adam was the first of something new. Adam was the first of many more to come. We are the many more to come from Adam. He passed that on to us. Jesus is the, the resurrected Jesus is the last Adam. He's the last new beginning. This is not talking about the, the Jesus in his form that he came on earth to, to die on the cross. This is talking about the resurrected Jesus. He is something like we had never seen before. He is a new creation. He was, when he was resurrected, he was the firstborn of many more to come. The firstborn of many brethren that would be after him. And that's what it's talking about. It's, it's a, we don't need a third Adam. We don't need a third beginning. This second beginning, the, this last one, is all we need. There, there is nothing besides him. And so I, I want to camp at this idea so that you can see Jesus maybe in a way you've not seen him before. And if you see Jesus in the right light, it, will, it can literally change how you walk in your daily life. So to understand this, we're going to have to share a little bit on then if, if Jesus did two different things when he, when he came and when he was resurrected, two different things, then let's, let's look at them. What were they? Now, we got a banker here, and I don't know if we got any other bankers out there, but maybe I'm saying a little bit of my age, but anybody remember when you used to have to really reconcile a, a checkbook to a, a bank account? <laughs> That's kind of fading away. Oh, they're just all doing it now, whatever. But you used to have to reconcile a checkbook with the information the bank sent you. And let's look at this as heaven and earth. Okay? There's the big bank, heaven. And it has what is the right thing. And it sends information, and you find out when you check your little checkbook, that's us, and we say, there's something not right here. There's an error. And, 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 and the checkbook of earth has an error with the account of heaven. The last Adam messed up, and until that error is corrected, we're in trouble. And the best of us could not fix the account. It didn't matter how good we were. It didn't matter how bad we were. It didn't matter. We could not fix the account. We could not reconcile the earth with heaven. We could not get the two to be on a ground that they could work with each other. And so we were in trouble. So you know what the Lord did? He sent us a heavenly accountant. He sent us Jesus. He's a heavenly accountant. He was going to take care of what we could not do. He came, and he, how did he come? He had to come as one of us. He came as one of us. He was in a body like us. And he, in that body, he, the holy accountant, reconciled our checkbook 
to the bank. He reconciled earth to heaven. Because when he came, there was an error. Nobody could fix the error, but the heavenly accountant, he can fix it. He took the body he was given and led it to the cross. And on the cross, that body was sacrificed for all sin, all error, all, all things. And in his death, he reconciled the checkbook with the bank. Are you getting this picture? It's, it's a fast little analogy, but he reconciled earth to heaven. Now they can communicate. Now they can deal with each other. Now, now we, we can connect again because we were disconnected. Everything was happening by faith. Remember, now it's reality. In reality, in Christ, everything's been reconciled. They believed for the reconciliation. That's God said he, he overlooked it because there was a reconciliation coming. And once Jesus came, he reconciled it with the death of his body. But let me tell you, when he took that body and he died on the cross, here's the point. He died. That body died. It died. Now we have to be able to know the difference. What, what did I just say? Okay. That, that means Help! When Jesus came, he was given a body. He came, was born of a woman. He had our body. He had, that body had our DNA. That body had to be protected. That body had to be hidden away in Egypt when Herod was trying to go after it. That body had to have angels watch over him. That body, remember when they came after him? He, he did not say, well, they can't do anything to me. He said, Peter, did you not know I could call 12 legions of angels? That body had to be protected by angels. Why? Because it could die. That body could die. He was given a body that could die. And he, that body did die on the cross where God wanted it to. Do you understand? They could not force him to go because he could stop it, but he went willingly, and that's where that body died. But dying and reconciling the accounts is not going to make us live. There's got to be something else. And in resurrection, now we have the possibility of life in heaven. Now we have the possibility. When he was resurrected, that was something we'd never seen before. It was not like the body that could die. Now he was in a body that could never die. And how many of you know, you, you, ever, tried to, you ever tried to kill an angel? <laughs> you probably haven't. Can't do it anyway. Angels live forever. Can't mess with that. Those, those are, according to the vernacular today, those are bad dudes. <laughs> Meaning they're good dudes. They're awesome dudes. Yet they had to protect Jesus. But the resurrected body doesn't need angels to protect that anymore. He's immortal now. He has an eternal body. Matter of fact, he's higher than the angels now. The very angels that protected him when he was on the other side, now he is Lord over. Now they were, they were sent to minister for him. Now he judges them on the other side. Come on, do you understand this? He said he was given a, a, a name far greater. Far, he, he, went, he far exceeded all the angels. And now we, if we're in Christ, we also will judge angels. So the Jesus who came in body, that one died. I, I want you to understand this. We will never see the like of that again. Because that body has been resurrected and it's totally spiritual now. Totally spiritual. It can't die. And where did he go? In Philippians, it says he, because he was willing to endure, uh, to, to learn obedience, even the death of the cross, it says, therefore God hath highly exalted him, meaning the resurrection. When he resurrected him, he created something that, that we had never seen before, and it was higher than the angels. He highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every 
knee will bow, every tongue, that Jesus Christ is Lord, which is the new name. Where's the Lord sitting right now? I guess he is Lord, isn't he? I guess he is in charge. He is at the right hand of the throne right now. Because he did this reconciliation, but then God had to have something else to bring his life, which was the resurrection. The body came to die for sin, to correct it. The uh, new life was to give us an avenue to eternal life. It is Jesus now, the resurrected Jesus, who passes out life to everybody. It's Jesus, the resurrected Lord, that, that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. You know, He could walk around empowered from the throne in the earth and show us how to do it, but He couldn't get it to us until there was a resurrection, and then He could pour it out on us. Come on, do you understand the difference between the two? All right, let's, let's look at that a little bit in some of the Scriptures. Let's go to the next one. Go ahead. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, how did we do it? Through the death of His Son. So the accounts were reconciled by the death. Now if God was willing to send His Son to make the accounts be reconciled, much more than having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now see, the body died, that body that he had died on the earth. And, and that's the death that paid for everything. But this resurrected one, that's the one that gives us life. Now if he was willing to reconcile us, and that's already done, how much more will he save us by that one's life? All right. <laughs> There's too much to say. You see, paying the price, loving the whole world. Did God love the whole world or just some of the world? Okay, so he, while the whole world is his enemy, he reconciled them by the death of the cross, right? But how many know reconciliation doesn't bring salvation? It only brings the possibility of. Because he reconciled, we now have the possibility of relationship with heaven. Now heaven can get in us because he reconciled the world. Therefore, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to reconcile us. That whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. So the reconciliation gave us possibility of salvation. And come on, are you, are you with me, church? The fact that he did that now gives us possibility to have the relationship. Hmm. The Bible says it this way in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He became sin for us in the body. That we will... No, that we might become the righteousness. In other words, He did it. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not here preaching, I sure hope God loves you. No, we have good news. Not only does He love you, He's proved He's loved you. He's already given His Son for you. You have already had the, the death of the cross make the accounts okay. Because of that, you have an invitation to join heaven. You have an invitation to be able to be invited to a wedding day of the Lord Jesus Christ with his bride. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He's the one up there on the throne, right there at the right hand of the Father. You personally have been invited by God to be part of that wedding day, to be part of the, the whole body that is joining with Jesus. We call it the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we call that group the bride of Christ. Men, get over it, but I'm going to use, use that term. You're going to be a bride today, okay? We're on our way to a marriage, okay? So that's where we are going, but it's because he reconciled us that we have that possibility. But if we don't say yes, we don't get to go there, even though he had paid the price, okay? But if he's willing to do that, how much more will he save us with his life? Go to the next one. All right, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, just before this, he's saying, if one died for all, then all died, and we consider that Christ died for everybody. So he's saying that. But now that you know the information that we've talked about, you, you're kind of getting used to seeing it that way. Watch what happens. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to what? All right, like this, the flesh. We're not looking to the flesh for our answers. We're looking somewhere else. If we're not looking at flesh, then where do we have to look to? 
you got to look to heaven. you got to look to Lord Jesus, not earthly Jesus. You have to look to the throne, not, not to the earth. Watch. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Come on. We don't know Jesus as the one who's walking around there anymore. How do we know Jesus? We know him as the one sitting at the right hand of God Almighty. See, when I, when I look at Jesus walking around uh, Jerusalem, okay, well, that's all right, but I could, do, I, could, uh, I could be messing around behind his back. I don't have to, you know, human Jesus walking around, I can, uh, I can be doing stuff. But when you look at Lord Jesus on the throne by the Almighty, remember John saw him, he hit his knees. You see, if we see him, it changes how we live here. We no longer consider anybody in the flesh for our direction, for our purposes. We're now looking to heaven. We don't even look for Jesus in the flesh because he was here, but he's not like that any longer. He's now resurrected Jesus. He's in a body that does not die. He is Lord of all. He is uh, at the right hand of the Father. It's a greater representation than what we had here. You understand? I don't even look for that. I look for Jesus high and lifted up. Right? That's what he's saying. So we don't look for him that way anymore. Therefore, because of all that, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? Now, isn't that what the new resurrected Jesus is called? He's the first of many more. He is a new creation. He is the beginning, the foundation, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the, the beginning of what the, all of our future is. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Has not what Jesus came in passed away? And what he now has is something totally new? Yes. And behold, all things have become new. Because now if I'm in Jesus, I'm not in the old Jesus. I'm in the new Jesus. I'm in the resurrected one. Now I look to him. Oh, help me, Jesus. I only got a short amount of time. There's so much to say. Okay, all right. Let's, let's say it this way. When Jesus was on the earth walking around, living with us, who did he pay attention to? What? The Father. Right? He said, I do whatever the Father tells me to do. I go wherever the Father tells me to go. Not my will. I know what I'm thinking here on earth, but not my will. Your will be done on earth, Lord. Is that not the prayer He gave us? The prayer He gave us was, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Worship of Him in His position. Hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come to the earth. Thy will be done on earth. So when Jesus was in his earthly body doing ministry on the earth, who had his attention? And where was the Father sitting? On the throne. So you're telling me Jesus was heavenly minded so he could live earthly correct. By being heavenly minded, he could now live earthly correct. We don't like that scenario. We want to be earthly minded. We want to think about Jesus on the earth. We want to think about us here on the earth. We want to take care of earthly things. And God's not calling us if we now believe in the resurrected Jesus to be doing that. We are now to be looking to Him, the resurrected Lord, sitting at the right hand, looking to Him for information, direction, everything, so we can live here correctly. Okay? Oh, I hope you're getting that. All right, go to the next one. Watch. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Watch this. Now that you've got the information you know, you may have read this many times, but maybe you kind of overlooked it. But look at what it says. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. How did I become dead to the law? Look what it says. Through the, the what? 
meaning the one that came to the earth that was put on the cross, we, by that reconciliation, the error was fixed. The law showed I had an error. The law said, which was the, like the, 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 the books of heaven said, you have an error. And until that error is fixed, the law holds you out. But Jesus came and with his body, he corrected the error. We became dead to the thing that was saying we can't get access to heaven. And by his body, he took care of that problem, that issue. And why? Why did he do that? That you may be married to another. Okay? See, I'm into the, the, the first Adam, and we're in his generation. We're going to do all his stuff, and we're going to die just like he died. Our only hope is that there's another. And who's the another? To him who was died on the cross, to him who was raised from the dead. You see, the one who died on the cross, that body died. You know, that one, that one would help him, but it does not help in me. But because he paid my wrath, I can now have an opportunity to be married to the new one, which is the resurrected Lord. Ooh, come on, church, are you getting I know this is a lot to think about. <laughs> to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. So now, now I can be married to another. You know, one of the exciting things about getting married is you get engaged first. <laughs> and that, that's kind of cool. The engagement's kind of cool. And I try to say that about us. We're engaged. We're not married. We're engaged on our way to getting married. Why am I engaged? How do I know I'm engaged and not married? Well, look at his body. Had a brother last night. I, you know, I got a haircut this week, and he says, hey, what's all that white stuff up there? I said, yeah, I'm getting more of it every time I get a haircut. Every time I get a haircut, it seems like I got more white hair. You know why? Because I'm connected to the first Adam. But when I'm resurrected, this aging stuff's going to be done. This dying stuff's going to be done. This cancer stuff is going to be done. This sickness stuff is going to be done. This not well stuff is going to be done. You're going to see a perfect me, and you're going to look at the perfect me, and you say, hmm, he's okay. <laughs> I'm going to look at the perfect you. I'm saying, Mike, you're doing all right, man. You're doing all right. <laughs> We're going to be perfect. And, and, and guess what? That perfect one can marry the one at the throne. This one cannot. I'm only engaged. I'm engaged on my way too. See, when I hear about that he's reconciled me and then he invites me to the wedding, he, he will engage me. He'll give me, if y'all say yes, he'll give me the Holy Spirit, which is the, the promissory note. It is the engagement ring of God to receive the Holy Spirit for my future. And now, how will you know? You know how, you know how it is, ladies, when you get that engagement ring. You know, it's like, it's like look, 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 look. Look, look what he gave me. And it's like, I mean, that's not, it didn't change everything, but, but it was a sign of something. It's a sign of a future. See, if, if we did God's principles right, this whole analogy would work. But we're all living together now. We don't even bother to follow the, the rules of God. You know, shout me down when I'm preaching. Good. We got mom and dads that don't even teach their kids the right way anymore. They just say, okay, you want to live together? It's all right. Because we, we don't teach our kids to be able to do it in God's way. God's plan is there'd be an engagement. And, and there'd be a connectivity. And there'd be a growth in that. And then there comes a, a, a moment of, uh, of when it all comes together and they become one. And God has a plan for that. And it's amazing if you get yourself into it. If you follow it in the way that God would have. You know, but, but many of us, we've already forsaken the ways of God. And it's getting into the church too. That even church people will say, we, we don't even promote it. We think it's okay. It's fine. Everything's fine. You know, we just love everybody. Just love everybody. You know what? If you were looking at the throne with the Lord Jesus Christ on it, you wouldn't just say that. You would change how you teach your kids. You would change how you would live your life before your kids if you're looking at the throne. If you're looking down here and using the salvation of God to excuse your sin, well, then you'll have all kinds of garbage. But if you'll walk with God in this way, it'll change your life. And what he does is he then engages us for our future.
I remember when, when I did that with Gail, got engaged to Gail. And, and, and I've told this story before, but it, it, it helps if we can just see it. You know, when, when I said she's the one, you know, the Bible says that he chose us first. He did, we didn't choose him, he chose us. And, and God said we were the one. And you know what? When, when I knew Gail was the one, you know what I did? I started putting money aside. I went to the jeweler. I said, that one right there. And put that in there, put that in that case. And I started coming in and, and, and I started paying for that. And it took a while before I could get it out. Because, you know, by the time I got it out, that thing had cost me something. <laughs> Come on, you understand? Know and you know what? When he engaged us, when he gave us the engagement ring, do you know it cost him something? cost him to be able to humble himself to come down here into earth to be in one of our bodies. It cost him to put that body on a cross and to be separated in that kind of penalty to pay our wrath. God, heaven gave the most precious gift it had because he was buying and preparing a way for a bride. He was, he was going to have a wedding day with you. That's how, that's how much heaven loves you. Heaven paid a big price for you. And when that thing was saved up and it was there and I went to the jeweler and it was finally paid for and he gave that to me because everything had been paid, now the possibility is there. Come on. Come on. Once everything is paid, now the possibility of a future is there, not the future is there. Then the offer of what has been put there and says, this is your possibility, all the future with me, everything I have can be yours. Will you say yes when I show you this kind of love. And hallelujah, Gail said, mm -hmm, yes, sir. <laughs> Give me that. You know, I said, when I got that ring, it was burning a hole in my pocket. It was just burning a hole. I want her to have that ring so bad. They said, what did you do for engagement? I said, as fast as I could. <laughs> no special plans. It was just like, I want her to say yes. No, you know, you know what, maybe I could have thought about it, but I was just too busy thinking about her. You know, and, and when she said yes, then guess what? It was just you're able to just pour out gifts, and she was able to see her future. We were able to be able to plan for it. And then came to that day when we had the wedding, and then we were Mr. and Mrs. Beth. She got a new name. Isn't that something? When we get to heaven, we have a new name? Yeah. You know? And she came into the house that we had been working on and, and, and lived in that place. And all the benefits, everything I had, she had. You know, no, no prenuptials. Well, I said, you're going to come, and, and if the marriage don't work out. Now, you see, everything has to work out, or else you don't get a marriage. It doesn't happen any other way. You're going into immortality. You're going into forever. You don't get a marriage unless everything's going to work out. That's why it happens there. It doesn't happen here. We're only engaged here. But, but by that engagement, I am drawn, I am empowered. He gives gifting, so now I can live the life. And literally, anybody who sees me will see the engagement ring. They'll see the power start to happen, the changed life, the provision, the things, the blessings. And why is that? Because I'm engaged to my future. I'm not there yet. We're not married. I still got this body that's got to be. But, but you know, just like he was, the things are going to happen to me. This body is going to be what? It's going to be sown in corruption, but it'll be raised... In incorruption. It'll be sown in weakness, but it'll be raised in power. Because that's what's going to happen to me. Because that's the way I get married to my future. When I see him on the wedding day, I'll be just like him. How could he marry anything else? Ooh, write that one down. How could he marry anything else? Except that you were just like him. Okay. All right. So he died, reconciled us so that we had the possibility of marrying another. So we could be raised in that newness of life to bear fruit. All right. Go to the next one. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. We know this one as a verse we've often quoted for salvation. We'll say to people, oh, believe this. But if you can understand what I'm talking about here, the, the Jesus who died... And, and laid that body down, then this new one, the resurrected, has a new body, something that's totally different. It may make sense to you about this confession for salvation now. Watch. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus? That's right. You, you don't confess the old Jesus. You confess the new one. 
the resurrected Jesus. Lord Jesus. Where's Lord Jesus at him? The right hand. We confess that one. We confess he's Lord. He's in charge of everything. Therefore, if he's in charge of everything, he's in charge of me. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that he died on the cross. No, that's what the old Jesus, you know, the old body, the, the body he laid down, that's what he did to reconcile us, but our possibility of our future is in the resurrected Jesus. Come on, church, are you getting this? The last Adam, the, the last new beginning, that's where life is. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. I heard a guy, just, I mean, just a couple days ago, and he said this. They were talking about a problem and an issue, and he, and he says, and, and yeah, Jesus was the Son of God, but look what that did for him. And what he's meaning was, yeah, yeah, all these Christians, they got the Son of God, and uh, look what that did for him, because he, he died on the cross. See, the man believes he was here. The man believes he died on the cross. And why did Jesus come? To, because God loved that man. And why did he die on the cross? Because he wanted to reconcile that man so he'd have the possibility of a future. But what is that man missing? He doesn't believe in the resurrected Jesus. And therefore, even though he believes God came, you know, Jesus, and he believes Jesus died on the cross, he has no salvation. There's plenty of people that believe Jesus was here, plenty of people that believe Jesus died on the cross, but they do not believe He's resurrected from the dead, and they do not believe He's sitting at the right hand of the Father because He is Lord of all. And therefore, our confession is not in the Jesus who came, but in the Jesus who rose and went back to heaven. Our confession is in the Lord Jesus at the cross, and our confession is in the one that was raised from the dead. I can tell that made you happy. Woohoo! That's the one I deal with. All my needs are, are met. My supply is met by His riches in glory. Do, do you understand? Everything is being met because He's on the throne. He now has the Holy Spirit to send. He now has all the power we need. He can meet every need. If we listen to what He's saying, He'll make everything be accomplished because that's where He is. And once I understand where He is, it changes how I live. See, many of us do not want to view Jesus on the cross because we want to live like we want to live. But if we would confess, look what it says. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Well, what did we believe with the heart? That he was raised from the dead. So I believe he was raised from the dead. You know, look, look, guys, if you, if you kill somebody and they won't stay dead, <laughs> they might be worthy of worship. <laughs> right? If you kill somebody and they won't stay dead, they might be worthy of worship. And so we have to confess that he is raised from the dead, therefore worthy of our worship, worthy of his place that God has given him. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in charge of my life. I confess that. Jesus is in charge of my life. See, when the Christian goes out and lives a life that is contrary to Jesus, he's no longer confessing Lord Jesus. I don't care what you say with your mouth. If you won't live it with your life, then you are not confessing Christ anymore. Ooh, don't shout me down. It's the truth. It's the truth. Why is it he said, guys, understand this. If you will not confess me before men, I won't confess you before men either. Is that what he said? No. He did not say, if you will not confess me here, live a life for me here, I will not confess you here. He says, if you will not confess me here, I will not confess you on the throne with my father. You're going to come to a wedding day that you're not going to go into. You're going to come to a door and you're going to say, did we not say, Lord, Lord? And I'm going to say, sorry, don't know you. You had a good talk. You had a terrible walk. 
You said you knew me, but you didn't know me, and I don't know you. We didn't fellowship together. You went your own way. You wanted a Savior, but you sure didn't want a Lord. And you would not confess me before men and women. And why did you think you would come here and I would confess you on my wedding day? That's where the rubber hits the road, man. Because we don't preach that gospel. You see, we don't see Jesus like that. We want him to be earthly Jesus. We want him to let me go off and be casual, man. Hey, grace will take care of it. Grace will take care of it. Are you kidding me? Grace put him on the cross. Are you kidding me? Grace does the engagement. Grace changes me. How do we turn grace into being okay with darkness? Grace is never okay with darkness. Never okay with darkness. Grace is trying to take you home. It's if you get to the wedding day and he says, yes, grace did that. Grace didn't allow you to be here and put up with your darkness. Grace doesn't say, it's okay. Grace is the one who chases darkness out of your life. Don't turn it another way. Come on, church. You understand what I'm saying? So our confession is made for what? Unto salvation. We get to salvation because we confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, sin is going somewhere. And it's not up. It's going down. And what's going up? Righteousness is going up. Mike, come on up here. Come on, brother. Don't get too comfortable. Come on. <laughs> All right, here's Mike. Everybody say, hey, Mike. You know what? When Mike and I are walking together, he's a brother in the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's there. You know, he comes. We, I get to see him do lots of stuff. He's a brother in the Lord. When we're walking together and we're hanging out, you know what? I might have uh, some sins and stuff like that, things that are, you know, things that happened in my past, who knows for whatever reason. But you know what? When I'm fellowshipping with Mike, I'm not doing them, am I? Right. You've never really seen me do it, have you? Now, I know there's ways the Lord, or the enemy could try to take me. But you know, when I'm in fellowship with my brother here, I don't do it. That's right. Now, I know you got some weaknesses. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know what they are, but you got them. <laughs> She'll tell you. And, but you know what? When we walk together, when we're in fellowship and we're talking, yeah. you know what? For some reason, our Lord and Savior kind of dominates the situation and we talk. And you know what? I don't see you doing that stuff. That's just me and Mike in fellowship. If we are in fellowship and unity here, it's not like, hey, let's go do our sin. Let's go do some adultery. Let's go do some whatever, mm -hmm. steal. Let's go rob a bank. No. Why is that? Because in fellowship, we're on target for what we're supposed to be after. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Now, but if we say, let's break fellowship, and he's going that way and going, you know what? Now, now, now we're over here, and we, and we don't think anybody's watching. Now we just might do it. Because we're not, we're not in fellowship. And we just, we, you know, whatever our weaknesses are, who knows? When we separate and we take away that strength, then we just might go into that stuff. All right, thanks, Mike. Now, now watch this. Jesus says it this way. Th that's just me and Mike. It's amazing if we, we would stand together, how much darkness would. I'll I have somebody come, and they'll be in the office, and they'll tell me what they're doing and how they can't help it and all that. And I'll just say, funny thing, I've never seen you do it. I've never seen you break out in anger. I've never seen you shoot up drugs. I've never seen you do that. Oh, I'm, I wouldn't do it in front of you. <laughs> so you would do it in front of your Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God Almighty. You see, if you would view and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ on the right hand of God, you would start thinking just like Mike and I think when we're walking together. We're not thinking about doing our sin. We're thinking about walking in the things of God. And when I view the, the throne, I'm thinking about that. And it's not coming in. See, that's why it says in John, do not say you walk in fellowship with God and walk in darkness. Do not say everything's okay 
if darkness is reigning in your life because fellowship is not happening and darkness at the same time. So when we get in a mode that we would put up with our darkness, that simply means we don't like viewing the throne. We don't like acknowledging and confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, it's quiet in this place. But that's our salvation. That takes us home when He is Lord and when we confess that life in the earth. That takes us home when we believe He is not any ordinary person. He is the resurrected, first newborn Lord of all, sitting at the right hand of God. All right, go to the next one. And this is Colossians chapter 3. Look at this. If you were raised with Christ, meaning that you believe not only that you died in His death, but you are now connected to His life. You've been engaged to your future. How many believe that? How many believe you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You are engaged to your future. I have been raised with Christ. How many believe it? Come on. Come on. How many really believe it? Now watch. If you have been raised with Christ, then seek those things which are above. Where should your gaze be? Where should your meditation be? Where should your thoughts be? Jesus is the risen Lord. Jesus is the Lord, Lord God, Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I should be meditating on that He's at the throne. I should be picturing Jesus as God Almighty. That He has every power. When I pray to them, He has every power to be able to meet the need of what I'm asking for. He can supply that need. Literally, I can pray and He will do. What was it? Jesus walking around the earth. He said, Lord, I know if I ask, you give it to me. How did He know that? Because He viewed the throne. How did He know that if He asked, Father, I already know you've answered my prayer. He hadn't even said, told Lazarus to get out of the tomb yet. How did he know that? Because he views the throne. How would it change our life if we would watch above? So seek those things which are above where Christ is. See, he's not in Israel walking around in a human body anymore. He is right up there. That's who we need to be looking at. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Not on things of the earth. How is it to set your mind on things of the earth? It's to take care of everything earthly. I'm taking care of everything about the earth. Everything about me. Everything about my retirement. Everything about my health. You know, and this is where, this is where the gym thing came up. I said, it is amazing to me in this culture how we fret and worry about our human life that maybe we can squeeze a few more years out of it. And we'll do everything and obsess over it to get it done. We will argue over food. We'll argue over lifestyle habits. And we'll, 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 we'll pass laws to change the government so we can get a few more years. But we will not view eternal things with any type of the same zeal. We would rather store up a few more years here than store up anything for heaven. And we invest and we invest and we invest in the things of the earth. And how much of it are you taking with you? Zero. Zero. You're not taking any of it. You squeeze out a few more years. Uh, Pastor Bill remembers this when Earl Tyson told the story of, of, of saying, uh, preaching and all that. And a, a lady out there comes to him and just, just like, oh, Pastor... It's such a shame that Jesus died. Think what he could have done if he'd lived into his 70s. <laughs> Think what he could have done had he lived into his 70s. And look what he did in 33 years. He reconciled us because he fulfilled what God had for him. It is not about you getting to be 120 years old. It is about you storing up treasure in heaven. It is about you looking at your Lord Jesus Christ and doing down here what He would have you do. It is about His throne changing your activity. His throne, His Lordship, His power on the side of God Almighty will chase darkness out of your life. 
We don't like to look up there, so we keep him as Jesus walking around Jerusalem. Nice old Jesus. Jesus wouldn't push anybody away, you know? But try to get in there on that day if you decided to stop confessing him here. Let's find out if he'll open up the door for you then. Because he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you did not honor him here, why do you think he's going to honor you there? All right, uh, go. Set, uh, set your mind on the things uh, above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Why is it we, that we don't let this dominate? Is because we're dead to it. We're dead to it. Jesus came into this realm and learned how to be dead to it. He only did what the Father did. So it was the Father doing the miracles. It was the Father doing all the touching and the blood. It was the Father, and He gave all the glory to the Father. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, see, when the resurrected one who is your life, how much more will he save you with his life? So it's the resurrected Jesus who is your life. And when he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Because when that thing is revealed, you're going to be just like him because it's a wedding day. He will not marry you not like him. He will marry you like him. Then we get moved in. We get our new name. We get our new name. We get... We get to a, a, be a pillar in the house of God. We get the throne. He gives us a throne just like he has a throne. He puts a scepter in his hand just like he has a scepter. He rules over angels. Now we rule over angels. He has a white horse, and we come back on what? White horses with ten thousands of ten thousands of his saints. I'm just telling you, it is a wedding day. We're engaged to it. And how do we live this life? We live this life looking at the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne. That is what changes somebody. That is what permeates us and causes us to walk like we've never walked. Go to, go to keep on going. <laughs> because of all that, because we're going to see him and be like him, therefore put to death your, your members which are on the earth, meaning do not put up with sin in any form. Yeah, don't get excited about that one. If he is your Lord, if you are viewing things above, if you are seeing Christ like he is, you will not put up with sin in any form growing in you. It has, are we perfect? No. But it has to be a diminishing factor. You do not put up with it anymore. Why? Because you know he's Lord. You know he's God Almighty at the right hand. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. That's why I'm saying, how on earth is it that Christian parents start saying to their own kids, it's okay, live together. You don't have to be committed to one another. You don't have to marry. Have sex. You know that's called fornication? Uh, let me say it again. Do you know that's called fornication? <laughs> Everybody's laughing now. Come on. Do you know that's called fornication? Yes. There you go. Yet we've got our own parents telling kids, yeah, it's all right. Why is it okay, Mom and Dad? Because I don't look at the throne, neither do you. But aren't you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I'm confessing Christ, aren't I? Oh, yeah. You just told your kids it's okay to fornicate. Man, it's quiet in this place. Do you understand our whole culture has gone that way because our culture is rejecting the God of the throne? Our culture, tells, our culture says, do not say the name of Jesus. And therefore... All these things are taking over our culture. Marriage is going down the tubes. There's no honor in that anymore. We all think you should be living together and doing whatever. And maybe, maybe if it works out, then I'll step up and I'll say I'm getting married before God. We have everything backwards now. Man, see, we don't even know what it is to do it the right way anymore. We don't know what it is to hold back your passions till it's the right time, to the right place. So we don't get to experience the real thing that God wants us to experience. For, so, so we are putting to death in our members fornication, uncleanliness, passions in the wrong places, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Let me say that again. 
Because of these things, wrath is coming. Punishment, penalty is coming. Because of those things. Now watch what he says. In which you yourselves once walked. You once walked. You once walked. You don't walk on them anymore. You mean we Christians that believe in Christ don't walk in fornication anymore? We don't... See, adultery is being married and not being faithful in marriage. Fornication is doing sex when it's not in marriage. Yeah, get it, Lance. Do you see how it's already affected us? We don't even know how to... That just like numbs us when we hear it. But it's the truth. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. We don't walk in it anymore. Why don't I walk in fornication anymore? Because I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He's on the throne. I'm viewing Him, and therefore I cannot walk that way. I have a pattern now, and I know how to follow it. And you may say, well, Pastor, I'm here in fornication right now. Well, then get out of it. Or correct it. Repent to God and get it right. Don't be sitting there saying, I, I, I'm never going to see sex that holy. Well, you ought to start seeing sex as holy. That's a God gift, and, you, and you're spoiling it if you're in the right way. All right. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Go ahead. But now, because you don't walk in it anymore, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things. You're to put all this off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. See, you might not be doing fornication. You say, oh, good, I got off. <laughs> I don't have to correct that mess or uh, hallelujah, thank God I got married. <laughs> but see, we don't put up with anything. We don't put up with anything. Are we perfect? No. But two steps forward and one step back is still going forward. Come on. <laughs> Here, I'll prove it to you. <laughs> one, two, one. One, two, one, one. Am I going the right way? Yeah. That's right. We're not perfect, but we know where we're going. We're headed to a marriage. We're going to an end to a salvation. We know what it is. Listen, you could come in and tell me all your mess. You could come in and tell me, I'm bound up in this sin. This is going on with me. I'm not going to look bad at you. I'm not going to say, oh, unworthy thing, you get out of Crossroad. No, we want people to come into Crossroad with all their mess and all their stuff. But we don't. We do not want to agree that you have to live there. You do not have to stay in your sin. You have a risen Lord who's on the throne who will empower a new walk. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. And if you, if you excuse yourself by saying, well, God, it's okay because God loves me, then you don't understand what we're even talking about here. We don't use God to excuse our sin. We know God, therefore we let go of it. We don't claim it anymore, and we know what the fight is. And the fight is to not live in that place anymore. And so if you're for real, you'll get yourself out of fornication. If you're for real, you'll stop lying to everybody. If you're for, for, for real, filthy language will disappear from your mouth. If you're for real, the, the life of the throne will be affecting your home. It'll change your very life. For we are putting off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of who? Of him who created him. So ultimately we're looking like the Father through Jesus who are both on the throne and at the right hand of the throne. Jesus is changing us here. All right. We dwelt a little bit of time on it. I hope you got something yeah. from it. Why don't you stand? Yeah. Praise God. All right. I want to give you an opportunity because somebody may be here and you may say, I've never come into a relationship with him. Or you may say, well, I'm religiously, I've been there, but, but obviously I haven't given my life over to him. 
I, I'm not even saying yes in certain situations. I, I'm living actually opposed to his kind of life, and I want to get out of it. If today you want to receive him as Lord and Savior of your life, you want to move into this love and what God has offered us. Well, brother, you, sister, you can do that today. If God's drawn your heart, if he's opened that door, why would you stay out? If God has reconciled you with his great love, why don't you enter in to what he's called you to, which is a future, an eternal future with him? Why don't you say yes by faith and let him touch your life by the Holy Spirit and empower you to start living a different life? And brother and sister, if you're here and, and, and you've been claiming it, but you're not living that life, well, then you need a, a, a rededication to the Lord. You need to re get rejuvenated on who you say you really believe in. And you need to get your focus changed. Because you need to meditate and take time to think about Jesus on the throne. It'll change how you do your life. Because when people pay attention to him, it affects them on the earth. It affects them on the earth. So if that's you, brother, sister, then I guarantee you, your brothers and sisters that are here that understand, they're going to be happy for you. They'll support you by saying the prayer. But you've got to be bold in front of men and women. Raise that hand and say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you today, boldly, brother. Sister, raise that hand. We'll say this prayer. Will you commend your heart to the Lord? Amen, sis. I see it. Amen. Praise God. Right here, sis. Right there. Awesome. Praise God. I see that hand there. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't want to miss anybody. Is there a hand back there all the way in the back? All the way in the back. Amen. Praise God. Got the hand all the way in the back. Anybody else? We've got the three hands I've seen in this service. Hallelujah. Let's say this prayer with them. Say it from your heart. God knows why you raised your hand, whether this is first time giving your life over or whether it's a reading. God will know. He, he knows why he's drawn you to this moment. But we're going to say in faith with you as you give your life over to him. Let's say this prayer together. Dear Lord, thank you for today. The words I've heard, you've used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior, and come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin, removing them out of the way. I repent of them, and I choose to live for you. So, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Teach me the ways of Jesus, that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And according to your very word, as I do this, I can declare by faith, I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Okay. All right, the usher should have gotten to you, those that said that prayer, those that raised their hand, and what they've given you is helps to be able to help you get started. And uh, if you don't have one, we want to invest in that decision. If you take that packet to the Welcome Center, we got a brand new study Bible in the same version that we used up here. We want to put it in your hands so you can take time to meditate on your Lord and Savior. You can go through that word, and it's got helps there to get started. And uh, please, if you don't have a home church, you don't have a fellowship, keep coming. Get into the studies. Get into these places. Get into fellowship, just like Mike and I were talking about, because it strengthens us. It, it holds us there, and God can continue to grow us, because if, this is re if you've really... Uh, given over to him, you'll find yourself drawn to fellowship. You'll want to be there. So begin to do that and let God begin to form in you what he desires to do. Amen? Amen. All right. And so we say together to, to all three of you, welcome to the family. Amen. Welcome to the family. <laughs> Amen. All right, church, seven days. We got seven days. Uh, imagine, look, look how many people are here. Imagine if we go out into Sussex County for the next seven days with our eyes on our Lord Jesus on the throne. With our eyes that he's right there meeting every need. If that he is there because we meditate on him, that darkness is going out of our lives, righteousness is increasing. What kind of effect will we have on this county the next seven days? I'm looking for something good. Are you looking for something good? Amen. Because I'm telling you, Jesus is after him more than we are. Jesus wants to touch the world you're about ready to go live in for the next seven days more than we do. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for doing a mighty work in our lives. Thank you uh, uh, that you are Lord, you are, you are Savior, 
you're the almighty God, and thank you that you have invited us to a future. And so, Lord, in that, we love you, we look at you, and thank you for empowering us in this walk that literally people will see Jesus in our lives and can be touched by the very throne of God, and we'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be